remember the mulberry leaves from my childhood, from my home far away. I remember in the springtime the grass sprouted as velvet on the fertile plains of Carpet. And the mountain streams flowed past our orchard on the outskirts of town. I remember in the springtime the tender mulberry leaves seeking sunlight. But I remember mostly the summer, the dark, green, brooding mulberry leaves and the tasty, ripened berries. One summer stands out as if it were yesterday. The people, their voices, whispering from the past. Every time I touch these mulberry leaves, I think of the Armenians who were killed 7,000 miles away. The seed for this tree came about 80 years ago from Harpet, a town in Turkey where I was born. For most of my life, I did not know what really happened during the first genocide of the 20th century. My parents merely told me that the mulberry trees had saved my life. How, I did not know. The past was shrouded in fear. What was the real story of the one and a half million Armenians who had disappeared from Turkey at the beginning of the 20th century? An ancient people, an ancient land. For 3,000 years, the Armenians had lived at the crossroads of the Middle East. For brief periods, they had their own independent kingdoms. But their land was in the pathway of conquerors, empire builders of the ancient world, Persians, Romans, Arabs, and Turks. Between the 14th and 20th centuries, the Christian Armenians lived as a subject people in the Ottoman Empire under fierce Turkish domination. In the late 19th century, oppression of the Armenians increased. Periodic massacres took place. No family would be left untouched. The Ottoman Empire was crumbling in the 19th century. By 1914, the Serbs, Bulgarians, and Albanians fought their Turkish overlords and established independent nation states. With the loss of territories in Europe during the Balkan Wars, Turkish leaders turned eastward with dreams of a vast ethnic empire extending to Central Asia. But one group stood in the direct path of Turkish plans, the Armenians. Under the cover of the First World War, Turkish rulers attempted to unify the Turkic people. They inflamed religious differences and embarked on a policy of deportation and genocide. The city of Harpert stood high on a vast plateau near a beautiful lake. The legendary Tigris River of Mesopotamia originated within the outskirts of Harpert and the mighty Euphrates gathered its force from the Harpert Plain. For centuries, the region has served as a granary for empires and a passage for invaders. Harpert was once part of an ancient Armenian kingdom on the eastern frontier of the Roman Empire. Here was the site of an ancient fort built a millennium before Christ. Here, man first used metal tools 9,000 years ago. Now it is a place of ruins and windswept barren walls.
Once, over two million Armenians lived in Turkey. 150,000 of them lived in Harpert and the neighboring countryside. Today, there are none. Centrally located in what is now eastern Turkey, Harpert stood at the crossroads of trade and commerce. In 1915, it became a focal point in the extermination of the Armenians. The filmmaker, J. Michael Hagopian, was born in one of the large dwellings on this busy street. Here as a boy, he first became aware of the tensions between the Turks and Armenians. Mezre, the main business quarter of the Harpert area, was the capital of the province, known in Turkish as a vilayet. The government house and the police station were on the main street. On the same street lived the governor of the province, called the Vali, and five wealthy Armenian manufacturing brothers, known as the Fabricatorians. Their elegant homes next to each other were admired by Turks and Armenians alike. They operated a large textile mill, producing fine silk and cotton cloth. Many farming villages ringed Harpert and Mezre, grapes for wine, mulberries for silk. Because of its productivity, the area was known as the Golden Plain of Harpert. The area was populated with Armenians, Turks, and Kurds, a Muslim people living mostly in the mountains. The distance between Mezra and Harpert was only three miles. Armenians referred to the whole area as Harpert. Americans and Europeans called it Harput. Among the Armenians who lived in town were many professionals, businessmen and teachers. The Armenians were also the chief craftsmen and artisans of the region. They were the economic backbone of the community. Their progress was often a cause of envy among the Turks. Their Christian faith was a matter of scorn. But no one knew then how drastically their world was to change. Amazingly, I found this photograph of my parents in the attic of a missionary family in Rhode Island after 20 years of research. My father, affectionately known as Dr. Mikhail, was the chief of surgery in American Hospital in Carpet. My parents were the only known survivors of the genocide of those who were photographed together that summer afternoon in 1914. Who saw, who heard what happened besides the Armenians? The voices of five people from Western Europe and America have emerged as key eyewitnesses to what happened in Harpert in 1915. Marie Jacobson of Denmark came to Harpert as an educator. She kept a detailed diary of the genocide. Mrs. Tacey Atkinson, an American medical missionary, kept one of two known journals of events of the genocide in the Harpert area. Another witness was her husband, Dr. Herbert Atkinson, the director of the American hospital. Johannes Iman, a German Protestant missionary, was the fourth eyewitness. He had come to the Harpert area in 1897 to direct an orphanage for Armenian children, whose families had been killed in massacres in the 1890s. United States Consul Leslie Davis was the fifth eyewitness from the West. He was the only American official in the interior of Turkey at that time. 
Garabed Bedrosian was the interpreter and bodyguard of the American consul. He was to play a key role in solving the disappearance of the Armenians. He and other Armenian survivors corroborated the five foreign witnesses who were residents of Harpert. The original purpose of the missionaries was to convert the Turks and other Muslims. They failed in this attempt, but the Armenians, who had become Christians 15 centuries earlier, found much in common with the missionaries. In 1878, the Congregational Missionaries established a college in Harpert, first called Armenia College. Under Turkish protest, it was renamed Euphrates College. Most of the faculty and students were Armenian. The missionaries in Harpert were from different countries, but they had a special bond. They often held social gatherings for the college and the hospital staff, and for diplomatic personnel and visitors. For the missionaries, it was a good life. For the Armenians, it was the calm before the storm. So we had picnics, long, long, whole, just incredible number of people who would really go up into the mountains. We dig a hole and put this huge crock with all types of vegetables and meats and so on, and cook it semi underground. And all through the day, uh, people would eat meze, uh, it's called, or d'oeuvres, drinking rocky, and we dance on oriental rugs, and then uh, certain groups of people would be in one place, and then other groups would be in a hill next to it and so on. And it, at night, we would start singing some Armenian songs that would be, um, we would sing certain stances of it. And, and groups in the other mountain would uh, echo and sing the second verses, etc. Sometimes the missionaries made trips to the banks of the Euphrates and to nearby Lake Goljuk. Harpert was ideally situated as a recreational area. The Euphrates River curved around the city some 10 miles away, and Lake Goljuk was only 20 miles to the south. Both the river and the lake were to play a critical role in the destiny of the Armenian people. The San Joaquin River in Central California reminded my parents of the two rivers of Armenia. I try to imagine what it was like that summer in 1915, a silent river, distant cries of anguish. I used to play in the mulberry groves. Now I try to decipher the past and give it meaning. As a boy growing up in Fresno, I never realized the significance of the term Goljik. My family had vacations there. Years later, I remember my parents picnicking on the banks of the San Joaquin River, talking about Guljik, Guljik, Guljik. Sometimes their hearts were light as they reminisced about the beauty of this lake. But most often, father and mother spoke in hushed tones with a terror in their voice I could never understand. We used to 
used to go camping up by Lake Guljuk in the summertime, up under the mulberry trees. My father and Dr. Shepherd would often meet up there and spend hours playing chess. They would put up a camp stool between them and they would study out those moves in chess and play chess by the hours. It was a lovely place overlooking the lake and there was a lovely beach there where we used to go swimming. And it was out underneath the mulberry trees. We used to eat the mulberries as fast as we could pick them. We had a good time under the trees. My mother wrote down things. She didn't write them every day. She just wrote them as they happened once in a while. But she did record a lot of what happened and what she saw and experienced and uh, put them in her diary along with uh, a lot of the material that she wanted to remember about us children while we were little. My parents knew the Atkinsons. They were our neighbors. But until I found her journal, none of us knew that Tacey Atkinson was keeping a secret record, one which could have exposed her to the Turkish authorities. The first entry by Mrs. Atkinson about the Armenian genocide was on May 2nd, 1915. May 2nd, several professors put in prison. The Atkinsons observed the tragedy that was unfolding from the vantage point of the house they had built. Mrs. Atkinson had personally designed the building and had done a great deal of the carpentry herself. She would often sit by the window to sort out what was happening in the street below. Marie Jacobson, the Danish missionary, was also keeping a diary. On May 1st, a day before Mrs. Atkinson's entry, Marie Jacobson, writing in Danish, recorded the same events in her journal. Der var megen uro i Harput. Flere butikker og private huse blev undersøgt og lukket. There was a lot of disturbance in Harput. Three of our professors and the teacher were fetched or picked up by soldiers and brought to the government building. A little later, they were brought to their houses again where they were while their houses were being searched. Any piece of paper with something written on was taken. All the men were put in jail. Everyone is scared and expect a massacre. May 4th. People are in great fear. Everyone says it's all been done according to a plan, and it's a certain beginning of a massacre. The German missionary, Johannes Iman, the director of the Armenian orphanage, could see the danger to Armenians. On May 5th, Johannes Eman addressed the situation in Harpert in a letter to the German ambassador in Constantinople Freiherr Hans von Wangenheim. He wrote, For a few days, strict house searches are conducted in the Christian houses in the town and its surroundings. People who appear suspicious to the government are arrested and the people are ordered to give up their arms. Before our uh, men were destroyed in the prisons, the Turks sent out messages that if the wives 
of these men would turn in all the guns. They would release their husbands from the prisons. And um, Reverend Ramir Khanyan spoke from the pulpit one day saying that if the women would turn in their guns, that the Turks would release their husbands. Whereupon Mr. Henry Riggs, the missionary, who was head of the colleges there, got up and said, if I were you, even if you don't have guns, buy them and turn them in. So many of the women bought guns and turned them to the government. Immediately, a message went to Constantinople saying that they had confiscated 1,000 guns.